I'm just going to present you this long interview with John Edwards. He runs an apostolate called uh, Just a Guy in the Pew. And uh, you will see some of his videos of some of his podcasts with Matt Frad and others on YouTube. And uh, so he's he's given me an hour and a half. I have to thank him so much for his time. I do encourage people to support his apostolate if you're over in the US. Um, and, you know, I was fascinated by his his story, his conversion, his his uh, love for the faith. I mean, some you'll just see it here anyway. So I'm. Um, just just please like and subscribe to his channel just a guy in the pew and follow his work i i do think we need more of this apostles in the church more we need strong men we need men of faith if you have men of faith you will have families of faith you will have a society of uh, with faith so please like and subscribe and um, i'm going to put some links down below to his website his youtube channel and then some of his other videos that he's done with with matt frad really inspiring story and you know it's great to see men that have the time to you know dig in and give us the faith you know brilliant guy can't thank him enough and um, and anyway please leave your comments below we'll try and get him back i'd love to do a conference in ireland next year and get him over and another speaker maybe maybe samuel baker from catholic men uk i'd love to bring them to ireland have a men's conference and trash out some ideas. I mean, uh, I, I thought this interview was brilliant, to be honest. I, I'm going to re listen to it again myself, uh, you know, and pick up points and, and so forth anyway. So anyway, God bless. Take care and let me know what you think in the comments below. Okay, bye bye. So I'm joined this evening with John Edwards from Tennessee and John um, popped up on my YouTube feed one day when he was having an interview with Matt Frad. And so I've been following a couple of his videos and, uh, and I'm delighted that he's taken the time to inform some of the Irish uh, viewers on YouTube of his great work and uh, especially in men's ministry, which is kind of vital. So, John, do you want to introduce a little bit yourself uh, and give a, give us a short history of, of your road to this ministry? Sure. Yeah. So, first of all, thank you, Robert, for having me, man. I, I'm really excited to be here with you. Um, yeah. So, my name is John Edwards. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, it's a famous place around the world because of Elvis Presley. So, live not too far from where he lived and uh, where Graceland is and all that. I have three children, uh, a 12 year old boy, Jacob and Allison and Caitlin are identical twin, uh, nine year old girls. And my wife, Angela, who's the angel of my life. Uh, I grew up Baptist born and raised here in Memphis, Tennessee. It's where I spent my, as much time as they would let me there until I was about the age of 18. Uh, at that point, a lot of people in our youth group, uh, decided to go off to universities that were around, uh, the area of Tennessee and, I was kind of left in Memphis by myself. I joined the local or enrolled at the local university at the University of Memphis here. Uh, didn't know what I wanted to do. I'd started working for an auto parts place uh, at the age of 16. So I was doing that. Um, you know, found out later in life, I had a pretty good father wound. So I was looking uh, for community and looking for people to like me and, you know, all of those things. And so when I got in college, uh, I didn't make a lot of friends at first until I joined a fraternity. And you know, I was making good money at the time. So what I thought was popularity due to people liking me was a lot. Uh, I had a lot to do with what I could do for them. Uh, you know, I could buy booze, I could buy drugs, I could buy gas and people to get into clubs, all those things. Um, and I was willing to do whatever to have people like me because I wanted community again in my life. So unfortunately, that led me to a lot of drinking, a lot of womanizing, uh, eventually to a lot of experimentation with drugs. You know, I did everything from LSD to, you know, pills to ecstasy and eventually cocaine. Uh, long story short, I, I did cocaine very secretly and hidden in my life for a long time, even through my marriage and, mm -hmm. um, and hit all that and continued to think, well, I got married, I'll stop. I had children, I'll stop. But it was a very uh, powerful addiction. And back in March of 2016, I was arrested on Holy Thursday, picking up drugs and went to jail. Um, had to wow. come to grips with everything in my life at that point. You know, I uh, was on the verge of losing my my wife, my kids, my job, my reputation, and everything. And Jesus came and met me in that jail cell. Not not literally, but you know, we we had a very deep conversation. I'd walked away. I'd walked away from him when my mother died uh, from cancer. I sort of blamed God for for allowing her to die and letting 
somebody who lived like I did uh, live didn't make sense to me um, why he would take someone like her and allow me to live. So I had sort of walked away from him and had a hatred, a misplaced hatred for him, um, Mm -hmm. you know, because of the loss of my mother. So I have an angel of a wife. She stayed with me. She took her vow. She made in the Catholic church that day very seriously. She gave me an opportunity to change. And that's what I did. When I came home from jail, I read Father Larry Richard's book, Be a Man, and and cover to cover that night, took it seriously, and then said, I can't just stop doing drugs and drinking the way I have. I have to be a different man. And so I started to get back into the scriptures and the word of God and uh, read about 70 Catholic books that first year, started going to daily mass. And, um, you know, the the pastor of my parish at the time took me under his wing. Uh, It was the first time I really began to, to take seriously that uh, our Lord was present in the body and blood in, in the Eucharist, uh, soul and divinity in the Eucharist. And, um, you know, I never had believed that I became Catholic when I married my wife and I did it to marry my wife. I was in love with her and thought it was very chivalrous of me to give up my Baptist faith for her, but mm-hmm. never really lived it for the first 11 years until this happened. Uh, that happened about six, seven years ago. And out of those moments with that pastor, out of that study and scripture and starting to be a better man, the Lord just put on desire of my heart to get out of my job that I had and go into full-time ministry to serve men and to really the, the crux of our ministry, the point of our ministry, the mission of it is to be like St. Paul. We have a podcast and all of that, and those are wonderful things. And we love using those tools, but the main mission of our group, of our, of our ministry is to go out and to um, start men's groups and parishes all over, whether it's in the United States, wherever, and help build a place for men to become authentic, to become real, to become vulnerable, and to admit they're broken, look for authentic relationships with with Jesus Christ, first and foremost, that is transformative, and then also with other men, so they can be real, they can leave the mask at the door and be the men, brokenness, um, you know, failures, successes, and joys, all of it in one, and be together with other men that want to walk towards holiness and virtue alongside of them. So that's really what we do. Yeah, it's 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 an incredible apostolate that that you have, because um, when we look around our society today, where we where we see so many broken men, and as you said, so many men with the masks on, um, uh, and I think it's 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 critical it's critical that we're able to go to places where sometimes a priest or somebody else is not able to go. It's 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 important to give Christ mm-hmm. hope, you know, where where we are. But I just wanted to pick your brains on, on, uh, for example, um, you know, men struggling with addiction and so forth. Somebody mm. mentioned to me it's it's about cutting ties. It's the tr- cutting the triggers that were leading them mm. into the cycle of addiction. Like how how did you manage to cut all of that when you went back to your because you didn't move house or leave your community. You stayed where you were, sure. so you had all of those trigger points around you. How how did you manage that um, uh, that that recovery process? Sure. Well, I mean, it was tough. Right. I mean, people ask me all the time, what was that like when I go give these talks? You know, that would be always one of the questions. Were you physically ill? All those things. And yes, I was for a while because I was doing this so often. Um, But the way that I honestly, it it sounds like a cop out sometimes, but the, the, the meeting with Jesus I had in that jail cell was so powerful. Like I, I really, when you're brought to, to, to rock bottom like that, you really look at it when you're sitting in a jail cell. And sometimes this works for some, sometimes it's multiple times or even a near death experience for some to even have to, to kind of for this to set in. But yeah, I remember looking around going like, I don't know if I'm going to get another chance, you know, like, I don't know if my wife's going to stay with me. And I've never, like for so long, I felt like I was trapped in, in somebody else's body, right? Like the person I really was, the young man that had loved the Lord, the young man that was a good person, the, the young man that I'd walked away from when I walked away from the faith felt like I, I just was trapped in this body of drugs and alcohol and bad choices and habits forever. So even the inkling of an opportunity to come out of that in that jail cell was like, I don't know if I'm going to get another chance like this. Yeah. Right? I don't know that I'm going to get a second chance. And especially when my wife said, I'm not going to leave you. I, all I thought about in the jail cell all day long was I've been a terrible husband. I've been a terrible father. I, I've had so many years now to be the good dad I always wanted to be, to be the great husband. And I failed miserably. And for some reason, God has looked at this poor excuse for a human being, this poor excuse for a man, 
and he's come and he's offering me a second chance. I may not get a third, right? I can't, I can't screw this up. So when I got home, I really just started pouring myself into the scriptures. I, I didn't drink beer for a very long time. Now I found out later that my addiction was really with the cocaine and I was drinking so much to offset the effects of the cocaine. So I could go have a pint or whatever now, and it's not a big deal, but the, but the other stuff, like I smoked cigarettes, I cut all of that out, you mm-hmm. know, and even the beer, I didn't have a beer for a year or whatever, six months, a year. But it got to the point in my life where when those inklings would come up, when I'd feel the hair on my neck stand up, when I was in the car and I would hear Eric Clapton's cocaine song come on and Mm. those, you know, those memories would come up, I would just, I would stop and I would pray and ask for the Lord's intercession. You know, Lord, I I, I don't want to go back there. I don't want this. I know the devil wants me back. I don't want this. You don't want this. My family doesn't want this. I would, I would close my eyes and I would think of my children and the moment when I came home from jail and they, they basically attacked me, like hugging me and crying. And, you know, I, I just, yeah. I never wanted to give that up. And so I always went back to that. Now I went to uh, rehab and that was very helpful. You know, I checked myself in voluntarily to that. I was going to an outpatient 30 day program and I learned a lot. It was, there's some things there I had to be wary of because it wasn't really Christian values they were promoting. There was a lot of Buddhism and, and a lot of mindfulness and a lot of that mm. stuff too. So you kind of had to filter some of that. But it made me realize when I went to rehab, there were so many people in there, Robert. I mean, there was a lot of young people. There weren't even 21 that were in there for their third or fourth stint with heroin. Yeah. You know, and I thought like, I don't want to, I don't want this to be my life. And so I took some materials they gave me and I read them. I took what I thought was good out of it and left some of the other stuff that I didn't want to really get involved in. Um, and then I started to go to AA, I, you know, I went to NA narcotics anonymous, didn't really care for it, went to AA and it was helpful for a while, but in, and I'm not knocking AA cause those are wonderful things. Those have helped thousands and thousands of people around the country. But the one particular one I went to, there was always a lot of negative talk, but not a lot of hope. Yeah. You know, it was just like, I didn't drink today and I guess it's a good day. You know, and but there wasn't a lot of my life is turning around. I'm feeling better. I'm changing. You know, God is present. There wasn't a lot of that. And so I I just, after a while, I just quit going and said, I, I think where my answers lie is just with our father, with God. Like he, I, I feel like walking with him and really throwing myself into the faith is going to be what I need. Yeah. Now, yes, I had the that I had the the feelings of wanting to throw up and vomit, you know, at the times of day when I normally would go do drugs and I didn't, you know, the retching, all of that, the desires to go back. But again, I, I really, I give it to the grace of God. I really yeah. do. And for the priest that he sent me, because he, he said, John, you can be better. When I went to confession to him after he gave me the Eucharist and I felt for the first time in my life that that was really Jesus uh, and we went, he took me to confession because I've been crying all mass. I was basically hiding in this daily mass and I've been sobbing, you know, and he took me back there to confession and, and I gave it to reconciliation and I gave him, I just let everything out and I wanted to beat myself up. Like I literally remember almost standing there as if I had like a baseball bat and I was doing the devil's job for him. Right? I was beating myself, but you don't understand father. I was a terrible husband. I'm still a terrible husband and father, you don't understand. I'm a terrible dad and I'm selfish and, Everything I would say, he's like, John, you're confessing that and you're giving it to the Lord and you're looking for his mercy and he's going to give it to you. And we're moving past that. You're not going to be that anymore. And I kept going like, but don't you understand? Like, I need to be chastised. I need to be beaten. I need to be, you need to see the terrible person I am. And this gift from God of a priest was like, no, that's not who you are. You're not the Mm -hmm. sum of your mistakes. You're not the sum of your sins. You're the sum of God's love for you. Yeah. Right. And you have the potential to be more because of that. And so he walked with me through all those things. And even into, you know, when I felt the the call to start a, something for men, um, I had a guy that we went to a conference and and he went to confession for the first time in a long time, uh, a men's conference here in Memphis. And he didn't understand why he felt so blissful. Yeah. <laughs> but he hadn't been to confession in 20 years. And, and I told him, I was like, if you had a moment with the Holy Spirit, He said, I'm cradle Catholic. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is. I know what God is. I know what Jesus is, but I have nothing, you know. So I went somewhere with him after he kind of browbeat me about it. You kept on about asking me to talk to him about it. I did. I felt convicted of my shame the whole time. The devil was in my ear going, what are you doing? Talk to this guy about God, you cokehead, you, you know, you addict, you, you're a scumbag. You never will be anything other than that. 
But this man sort of called me into, you know, explaining this to him. And through that, he said, you should start a men's group. Mm -hmm. And I told him, you're nuts. And he said, no, you need to. I never told anybody outside of people who had to know what happened. And I felt convicted by the spirit to tell this guy I was arrested on a felony charge of cocaine a year ago. I'm not your guy. Yeah. And he looked over at me and said, wow, that's amazing. You should start a men's group. And I thought he didn't hear me or something. You know? So I did you yeah. not hear what I just said, but he invited me to do it. And I was a guy that didn't have skills. I didn't know what I was doing, but the Lord said, I want you to do this. I gave him my yes. And, and so often what we don't want to trust is that, the, that God will fill in that which we lack. And, um, and he's done that in my life, but he's done the same thing with the addiction. You know, I, I, there's been times I've even been around it. I went to something uh, about a year ago and an old friend was in town and a bunch of people had him over and I went over there by myself and was just going to say hi to an old friend and walked in the room and there that stuff was. And I turned around and I thanked him for having me and I walked out of the house, wow. you know, because I, I just kept picturing yeah. My, I, I am now the closer to the man that I've always wanted to be. And, and I have a gift in my wife and my children. I will not trade that for anything. Yeah. Cause uh, somebody was telling me um, there are, there are some good Catholic programs for people with addictions, such as Chinacolo, but when you can, you can be there for one or two years, but if, if you leave and you go back into the environment where you were living, uh, you're not you're not accustomed to all those trigger points like you, you yeah. and and you could be overwhelmed and, and you know and just overdose um sure. you know, and when you leave those programs and what i think what is great what you're doing um and what others that i see are doing is they're helping people in the environment where they are and mm -hmm. and this is where i think it's kind of critical uh, in this type of ministry is that we're able to arrive to men where they are and support them where they yeah. are i mean you can have a men's prayer group you can have a men's um ministry that involves all different type of men with different problems all they're helping each other not all of us have to have the same background to be able to walk with sure. each other and strengthen them and you know and strengthen their families um you know when i, I was interesting because i was over in the us um in 2019 before the pandemic kind of touring around to see how you catholics um live the faith and uh, <laughs> uh i actually went up to your neck of the woods up to Ru ruby falls um, oh yeah i know yeah. exactly where that is yeah yeah so it was, uh, you know and it's a, a, and the you know the south of the us you have a lot everybody's christian it seems you've more you've more baptist churches than mcdonald's so i mean sure it, yeah <laughs> Yeah, uh, there's a Protestant church on every corner in Memphis. Yeah, that's right. And I think Americans are a little bit uh, more open to ex um, expressing their feelings. Uh, maybe I'm I'm a little bit wrong in that. I'm, oh, sorry, sure. Irish are a little, bar, little bit more reserved, which can be a problem. Mm -hmm. But I think Americans can uh, you express their their feelings a little bit more. But men tend to not want to acknowledge their problems uh, as much as women sure. would be. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, ju I just um, it's just interesting to uh, to see where because a lot of ministry in the church now, it seems to be focused on a um, on priests and nuns and religious and bishops. Well, they're doing all the work. And in reality, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if we love our Lord, if we love our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, he is. Uh, I mean, I've had I've I've. You know, I've had a similar experience of yours uh, encountering Christ in my life. You know, really changing a lot of the problems I had. You know, my father yeah. was a was a was an alcoholic, and uh, you know, mm. it, 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 these things impact you in your life. You know, and uh, never really had a conversation with him. Not that he was a bad person, but that addiction completely, you know, completely consumed his life. You know, and I didn't mm. want I didn't want that for my kids. Um, but um. I, I when I started my podcast here in Ireland and never really thought it it take off a lot of people were reaching out to me oh you had a conversation with this guy and that really inspired me and you had a conversation with these other people yeah and and I can see your conversation here touching the hearts of a lot of men around Ireland you know that are mm -hmm. struggling with um their addictions with their problems with their depressions and really this the, the simple experience of going to confession receiving communion, laying your life out there uh, mm -hmm. and moving forward in the light with the help of other people um, is transformative. So I suppose I want to pick your brains. How, how did you form men's groups or, or, or how did they roll out? How did your apostolate progress over the last uh, six years uh, since you've sure. had? Uh, yeah. 
Oh, no, that's a great question. Um, you know, one other thing I want to say about the triggers really quickly is I cut, I cut a lot of things off in my life, right? I, I had a lot of friends that I loved that I did that with. And I just told myself I couldn't go around them anymore. Right? Like I like if they're going to continue to do this, or if it's going to be things that pull me back to where I was, and I'm just going to have to cut out some of those things. So what you're talking about triggers, I mean, a lot of that, I moved forward in my life, and I just got more involved in the church, made friends there, kind mm. of left a friend group behind that, that, you know, that was still their life. And so you have to make hard choices like that. And, and that's really, that's really what the Christian is called to, right? I mean, Jesus doesn't say, Hey, come on, it's going to be a party every day. He yeah. says, you know, pick up your cross, lay down your life. Uh, you're going to be persecuted because they persecuted me. You're going to be hated because they hated me. Basically, you're going to have to lose things when you decide to follow me. Uh, things that aren't good for you, things that, that, uh, that may be hard for you, but the, the eternal reward and what waits for you when you are willing to surrender and give up those things, because the Lord knows better than we do what's best for us, then he waits for you on the other side of that with gifts that you couldn't imagine. Um, just wanted to say that real quick. As far as the uh, how the uh, the apostolate got going, you know, I, just kind of picking off where left off with the priest, um, you know, I, I just felt after Jay, uh, my friend that asked me to tell him about the Holy Spirit, said, well, you should start a men's group. You know, he convinced me to. I went to the parish and walked into a room full of men. Again, the devil tried to convince me on the way in when I grabbed the door handle. He started <laughs> saying, you know, you're going to lose things. Your wife's going to be embarrassed. Your kids won't be allowed to go to school here anymore. You're going to tell all these people these things. You're going to lose the friends you've made over the last year who don't know. And I let go of the door and walked away, you know, and, and I got about three steps and heard that sort of small, still voice, you know, you hear about in the Old Testament. God's not in the earthquake or in the fire or in the storm. He's in the whisper. And, you know, when I'd walked out of that jail cell, Jesus kind of had me turn around and look at that cell as I walked out. And mm. I can remember him almost saying, like, you tried it your way and look where it got you. Like, give your life to me and try it my way. So I promised him I would. So in that moment, when I started to walk away, that voice came back and was like, John, you, you told me you're going to be different. So I turned around, opened the door and there was 30 men in there and they had no idea why they were there. Uh, my buddy was supposed to, that asked me to do this was supposed to be there already. And he was supposed to at least have beer so that they would stay calm. Right. <laughs> Something to keep them preoccupied. <laughs> he wasn't there yet. So I walk in and they're all staring at me going, well, what are we doing here? It's a Wednesday night. Well, you know, what's the deal. And he finally shows up, comes in, gives everybody a beer. And I just stood up and, and, you know, for the next hour proceeded to just very probably badly share my life, just went blah. And, 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 and said, look, we have a great men's club here where we cook barbecue and we raise money for our kids' school, you know, basketball mm -hmm. uniforms and all that. But we never talk about Jesus. And let me tell you what can happen in your life when that's the case. And I went, blah. And I told everybody like an hour's worth of every detail that I kind of skimmed through with you here. And the whole time I was sitting there worried, like they're going to leave men are going to get up. I'm going to lose everybody. People are just going to be, we're going to be the talk of the school in the parish for months. It's, it's going to be embarrassing for my wife. So I'm sobbing and just like ugly crying and I get done, you know, I get, I, I finished and I said, look, I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, I don't even know what I was going to do when I came here tonight, but I know one thing I can't be the only one who's broken. Right. And I can't be the only one who struggles and I can't be the only one who's messed up their life in some way or another, whether it's now or in the past or in the future. And all I know is I, I try to do this all alone and I failed horribly and I need other people to walk with. So I want to start something in this parish for men. And I don't know what I'm doing, like full disclosure. I don't know what yeah. I'm doing, but I'm willing to learn. And if you think you need something like this too, then stay. If you want to leave, you know, this isn't entrapment. You didn't know why you were here. You're free to go. Thank you for coming. And I just sat down like a sack of potatoes, just boom, wow. you know, just going, oh my gosh. And, and I'd seen men's eyes getting bigger and bigger and bigger as I was sharing all the you know, details of my life. Well, all of a sudden the guy next to me stood up and it was a guy that asked me to come. And I thought, well, surely you're not leaving. You're the one that asked me to come. <laughs> and I look up and he's crying. Oh, and he, he just says, man, yeah, he says, I'm a, I'm a, uh, he goes, I'm a terrible father and husband. I care more about my wife and kids than I, I mean, I care more about my, my money and my job than I do my wife and kids because of the way I spend my time. And he sits down mm -hmm. and the next guy gets up and he said, my wife's divorcing me. She's already left. Uh, I struggle with porn and she's had enough. Mm -hmm. Um, the next guy got up and he said, I'm drunk. I Ubered here, right? I got a cab here. And 
And I've been in a hotel room all day drinking and my wife and I fight and we have nine kids and my work thinks I'm at home and she thinks I'm at work and I'm drunk right now. I Ubered here because I thought we we're going to be drinking more beer. Right. Oh, wow. And then all the way around the room, it was like pistons in an engine. The men were up and down and every single one of those men stayed and every one of them shared something in their life they were going through and that or something that had happened. And, and, you know, Robert, it really showed me that this, like, like God's definite, like the, the meaning of, and the power of vulnerability in a mm -hmm. man's life. And, you know, men here in the United States are tough nuts to crack too, right? Most of us yeah. have been, if, if you're my, I'm 40, about to be 44 in November, you know, if you're my age or, or older here in the States, at least, I'm sure this is probably pretty, pretty universal. You know, men have just been raised as like, you're a machine, right? Like you have no feelings. You don't need feelings or no place for them. Work hard, put your head down. Don't complain. Don't need anybody else. Be a one man army because, you know, to need someone else to have emotions, to have those things is weakness, yeah. right? That's not being a man. Being a man is powering through, you know, you know, fighting against all odds, all that kind of stuff. And so as men, we don't deal with the things that are wrong with us. And there's yeah. two ways we're going to deal with things. Either we're going to do it healthy. We're going to give it to God. We're going to, we're going to surrender to him. We're going to look for his mercy. We're going to, we're going to be able to take those times of suffering as yeah. invitations from our Lord to grow, or we're going to not have a relationship with the Lord and have no idea how to do that. And we're going to medicate through drugs, through alcohol, through porn, through whatever else out there that makes you feel better for that tiny instance but it never solves the problem. Yeah. So God showed me that night that when one person becomes vulnerable, that things can be different. You yeah. know, what I did basically, what he used me to do that night basically was to give permission to men to say, I'm not okay. Right. Like I'm not fine. And, and this is just, you don't have to have a drug problem or an alcohol problem. We all have anger issues or, or wounds from what you were getting at a minute ago, you know, wounds from an alcoholic father or from, from a father that never told you he loved you and was proud of you or a sexual trauma or something. We all have versions of these things. And when we don't become vulnerable, when we don't share those things as, as men, especially we like to, to lock those away in a stronghold of our heart. And we mm -hmm. think if I just shove them down, if I just shove them down, if I drink them away, if I smoke enough, you know, weed to, to put them away, if I watch enough porn, then all of it, I'll just feel better and I can forget about it. But we don't. What we do is we it causes wounds in our heart. And we basically try to scab up over that. But those wounds never go away. They and yeah. they they come out of us and everything. You know, I could look back at my father wound. My my father never told me he loved me, he was proud of me, any of that. Even the best things I ever did were never good enough. Mm -hmm. And that made me, you know, men already have a deep fear of inadequacy. That's our main fear, whether you realize it or not. Men, all men are are afraid of being inadequate in their job, in their relationship with their wife, with you know, anything in a sport, whatever, um, and, and not being good enough. And so I had that wound. And I could look back at relationships in my life where I ruined relationships with other men, with my brother-in-law, with things where I damaged them because I was trying to blame them for some way I felt, but really it was a wound in me that was never healed. Yeah. And so the way that we heal these things is we allow God, the divine healer, our father, to come in and sort of pull the scab back. And that's really what being vulnerable means. So the Latin root of the word vulnus is wound. So yeah. you're literally, when you become vulnerable, is opening that wound. And so, you know, St. Paul, the world has that definition of vulnerability is powerless, weak, less masculine, feminine. You're not a man, you're a wuss, whatever you want to say when you become vulnerable. But then God has his definition, which is he gives to St. Paul. St. Paul says, I have this thorn in my side. And he says, I begged the Lord to take it from me three times. But the Lord said, no, my, gracious, my, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Hmm. this is this is like an oxymoron strength like power and vulnerability strength and vulnerability doesn't seem like they go together but it's, it's it's exactly how you become as strong as you possibly can be as a man because what god is saying there is you need me right like that thorn in your side i put there because you need to know that you need me right and it's through my strength that you become strong not yours you humble yourself. And that's what happened to me in that jail cell, right? Like 
I, I tried to control my life. I tried to run everything. I tried to hide. I tried to bury my wounds. I tried to drink away the, the pain of my mother's death and, 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 and snort away the, the pain of all those things. And then one day God said, it ain't going to work, right? You, you need to humble yourself and realize the reason you're in the situation you are is because you walked away from me and you need me in your life. And I'm the only one that's going to be able to fix this in your life. And so St. Paul, in the same regard, says to the Lord after that, well, if I'm to boast, let me boast only of my weaknesses, my hardships, my difficulties, my burdens, because when I'm weak, I'm strong. Like yeah. realizing I am broken, I'm not enough. Instead of trying to do what the world tells us to do, which is to grab the steering wheel of your life and just, nope, I'm going to make it. I'm going to do it. I don't need anybody or anything. That's what gets us into trouble. But yeah. when we we admit to the Lord that we need him, then we become vulnerable and we do that with ourselves. You know, to me, I have a problem with cocaine. Now it's very evident. I'm in a jail cell. I can't lie. I can't dodge a duck it anymore. I can't go anywhere. I have to deal with this. And then in the confessional, God, I can't do this without you. So vulnerable with him. I need your help. And then eventually to your point, the men's group stuff, I, I needed other people in my life. And so that group became that for me. And then over time, you know, Robert, I never said like, I'm going to go get into ministry. I just <laughs> felt over time, you know, as I, as I was working my regular sales job, things would happen. You know, my job just didn't feel as fulfilling. The only time I really felt joyful in my life is when I was helping other people and talking about our Lord. Mm. And so the Lord started to just sort of feed into that. Um, people in the diocese of Memphis heard my story and said, will you be a witness speaker at our men's conference? The same one I'd gone to the year before. And, and I said, yeah, I'll do it. I shared my story. Uh, my wife and I came to realize that our pain and suffering wasn't just for us. If it was, it was wasted. It needed yeah. to be shared with other people. And, you know, a deacon in my, in my diocese has a show on EWTN called the Catholic Cafe. Uh, I was in a Curcio group with him. And he said, you know, you're doing all these amazing things with men in your parish. And you're telling us about them. I think that could be shared with men around the world. And I was like, get out of here, man. Nobody wants that. You know, and he said, I've done this. I could build a podcast. I could help you. I think you could really help people or the Lord could help people through you. And so I said, yes. And that's how just a guy on the pew was born. Um, I was working for Cardinal studios that put out stuff like strive with Matt Frad and rise mm -hmm. with Chris Stefanik. So I got my feet wet in ministry. Um, and then realized after that, you know, that job kind of came to an end. They moved into a different form of work. It didn't need me uh, in the, in the way that they had needed me before. So my wife came to me and said, why don't you start a nonprofit? We started in Pew Ministries. We put just a guy in the pew in there. And then I started, as I started doing shows and stuff, guys were reaching out and saying, man, I really like this show. Like this is, yeah. there's something different about this. Like you're talking about real things and you don't feel like this isn't high bar theology. Like, I don't feel like I have to go to four years of, you know, of seminary to understand what you're talking about. You're really making accessible the scriptures the teachings of our Lord through everyday issues and problems that people face. And, and Robert, a lot of times I think, and I know I've talked a lot, so I'll, I'll be quiet here in a minute because I know you probably want to comment, no, but, no. Um, but, but I, it really, the Lord really started to show me that like everything that he, he has tried to do is about relationship. It's really about, if you look at how he called the, the apostles, it wasn't, Hey, go read these 617 Levitical laws and then come follow me. If you're into it, everything he led with was, what do you seek? What are you looking for? Come and see, follow me. Very relational terms. And when we we speak to people about our faith in this way, this is what Jesus used in the ways he used to transform people. Now, I didn't start out going, this is what Jesus did. It's just what he revealed to us over time. And so when men are reaching out and they're saying, I was about to leave my wife and now I'm not because you've shown me that there's a different way. You know, yeah. and, and and through the the story and the testimony of your life and of Victor's life or the guests you've had on, I could see there's a different way. And so very quickly after that and, and more and more recently, I just started to go, what are my gifts? Like, are my gifts just to be another talking head in the Catholic world, you know, to be have another yeah. 200,000 person YouTube channel? Or are my gifts really to go and teach men how to lead and teach them how to yeah. be vulnerable? And be like St. Paul and go spread the seeds that will last. Like go teach others to lead and to fish and then build these places that men sorely need in our, in our parishes across the country. That's not built on me, but it's built on the skills and the, and the things we could teach. And then they can go and lead their own groups. So yeah. that's kind of how we've gotten to where we are.
Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's vital. I mean, if you if we think of what's going on in the church today, we have this kind of divide between traditional and liberals. You know, I I, I love my traditional Latin mass. I love that side of my faith, but sure. really, the center of the church, what you are doing, what you are doing. I mean, you probably don't see this, but you are doing what bishops are spending millions on, which is reviving the real faith in the Eucharist. Because you have been nourished by receiving the actual body and blood of our Lord. You've gone to, you've met him in confession. Yeah. You've met him in the Eucharist. He's building up. He's converting your heart. That is the renewal. I mean, people, your men's ministry, yeah. because once you get men straight, once you get them, you know, once you get them focused on the faith, their families fall into place, their children will fall into place. That's Things right. will, do you know what I mean? The church will renew from from this type of ministry and, and 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 it's important that men listening to this you don't have to have been a drug addict and been you know in the you, you you can be there to help other men you know in in prayer groups and what you're yeah. what exactly what you're doing give them the support that they need pray for them pray with them you know i i think really uh, if you survey, if you survey the Catholic world, especially the English speaking world, there's not many people that are actually doing exactly what you're doing in the sense that trying to get this message out there uh, for 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 men in this in this moment of time. I mean, I because I did my survey and trying to see, you know, who who is doing this because you, this is the bedrock, this is the building block, you know, because you have these mm -hmm. problems that you talk about. They're in every community. If you can go to traditional Latin mass sure. communities, you're going to find them there. You go to any any of these, and we need to to take a step up in the in the church now as laymen and to give leadership for the next generation. I mean, there should be a hundred men like you doing the same thing, blogging about the same thing, helping the same way. Maybe God would call them in due course, but I I, I just hope think so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's inspiring the the the, the work that you're doing in the sense it's it's that. You know, boots on the ground, getting men involved, um, sure. and and I'm and I'm just putting feelers out here to men around Ireland because people people uh, have reached out to me. You know, where do you pray? Um, you know, and and I don't I don't talk about it in my podcast because where I go to pray is not where. I, I didn't start it or organize it or anything like I got to sure, it. Sure, sure. I, I went through Exodus 90 and I met somebody. And so I, I won't talk about it in this podcast because it's not my my um I don't organize the prayer there. It's some done by somebody sure. else. But people have heard me talk about there and they've asked, where do you pray and how can we get this going? And I think what you're doing is kind of the blueprint that we should be following to get mel men involved in the faith, you know, to bring others along with them that don't, you know, some men might not have the addictions, but they can help others that are struggling and we can bring men mm -hmm. up and bring families up. Like, how do you, how do you think we could spread this more in the, in, in the Catholic world, this, this format of, of helping men, this men's ministry? I mean, uh, you know, that's what we're trying to do is, is, is trying to go on as many shows, things like that as we can, um, because, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are speaking similar messages. Um, the problem with a lot of ministry, I think, is we ministries become like, I'm just going to produce content that's going to change the world. Well, if content what is going to change the world, it would have already done it. We have to have those boots on the ground, right? You have yeah. to, you have to like literally go in and we're a lot of, and this is not to say I'm better or what we're doing is better. But what I looked at it was like, how many ministries we're making a shiny box and saying, here's your DVD set. Just get some guys together in a room, hit the play button, let the babysitter run, and then let them go on and then feel good about yourself because you met every week for whatever. And it's like, no, at the end of the day, who's, who is, 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 you know, who's feeding the leaders, you know, as a guy in ministry, you pour out all the time and very often you're not poured into, right? Like you could be, you are in your prayer life and things like that, but you don't always have a lot of people pouring into you. There's a lot of DREs and catechists and things like that. I've talked to that just feel like I'm constantly giving to the point where there's nothing left to give because there's no one pouring else into me, you know, pouring into me. Yeah. That's what I think is missing in the church is it's like, we ask all these people to be leaders and we basically, when they show up, we hand them a shiny box, you know, just do this, just do this, good luck and send them on their way. And, and it's, it sets them up for failure because at the root of all of this, what we're doing, I think it's a little different is through the identity piece and all of that. So many people think they're unworthy, think that yeah. they're not good enough, think that they're not loved. 
And if you don't get someone past that, then you could have them show up and they're always going to fail because that voice in their head they're listening to is always going to be the voice of the devil. You're not good enough. You wouldn't, you wouldn't ever be. God possibly couldn't use you. You're going to fail. All that kind of stuff. And so people give in and they do. The, the church right now, what I think it needs more than anything is the field hospital. Yes. And that's what we're trying to be, is trying to repair these hearts to say, you are not the sum of your failures and your sins. You are the sum of God's love for you. And part of that is getting Catholics in general, men and women, when they read of the word of God, not to look at it like I'm reading War and Peace or some other book, but as the living word of God. When you see uh, Jesus being baptized, first of all, let's just talk about that. Jesus was God. He didn't need to be baptized. So why was he baptized? For you. See, he was basically kicking the door of heaven open that was shut when, when Adam and Eve, you know, bit into the apple, we had the fall and sin and death came into the world. We were severed. We were, we were severed from God. And now there was this reconciliation, this charisma, the love story, which is the life and the plan of God through Jesus Christ from the old Testament, all the way to the new Jesus, you know, he was, he revealed the old and the new, he made the old Testament, you know, come to fruition. And so in this, we have to realize, um, Lost, gosh, I lost my train of thought there. Or I was going with all this. Sorry. Under, under we, groups. Oh, yeah. 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 And the baptism. So we we have to realize that that this was Jesus did that, was baptized so that we had a pathway back into the the family of God, right? To into the holy family. We become part of God's people and into his kingdom again. But when you read that, it's very easy to go, well, yeah, this is when Jesus gets baptized and God's proud of his son and the dove comes down and, you know, you're my beloved son. Well, I'm pleased. He's saying that to each and every one of us, right? Mm -hmm. That baptism is not just for Jesus. It's for us. And God looks down on us. And one of my favorite translations is not with whom I'm well pleased, because that still sounds to a man like you got to do something, right? I went out there, I scored a touchdown and my coach is pleased, or I, I scored a goal and it's pleased. There's translations that say, this is my beloved son with whom I delight, right? I delight. It's very different. God's saying to you, I delight in you. And why, what did you do to earn that? Nothing. Someone poured water overhead when you're a baby. You didn't really have a say in that unless you were a, a, an older convert. God's saying that you have to do nothing for my love. It's a free gift. And we have been so conditioned as men, because of our relationships with our fathers or our imperfect parents or our, our, our coaches or whatever in our life, that we have to earn all of this. With mm. God, we don't have to earn it. It's a free gift. And when you come to understand that, then you start to say like, yeah, I have messed up. I am broken. I, I, I've done things I'm not proud of. I haven't been the right person. But yet here's someone in my life who, look at the loneliness in the world. We all want to be like feel like we belong like someone wants us, God physically claimed you in your baptism and said, you are mine. I want you. You're needed. There's a purpose for your life. And when you come to understand that, the joy that we're all looking for when we're putting our third bottle of booze down in a night or when we're taking our fourth you know, line of cocaine in a night or we're smoking our, our, our fifth joint for the night or whatever, what we're looking for in that is to be found in the father who says you are mine. And when we find our purpose and we start to live it, that's when we find the joy in our life. And for me, that has been in these men's groups. And, and so that's what we want to do is go teach other people. Look, I was a guy that used to be Baptist, knew this much about being Catholic, but knew that Jesus loved me and that he loved you too. And let's go talk about it. And the miracle in that, Robert, is people would come up and say, well, when are you catechizing these folks? And I'm like, I don't even know what that means, right? Like, I, <laughs> I just, we're, we're introducing them to a place to be real, to be themselves, to other men that want to do the same. And in the middle of that, guess what? The Holy Spirit showed up and worked. So when I went to our local Catholic bookstore to visit my friend that runs it, that's a consecrated virgin in the diocese, I'd go in there and I'd see my buddy John, who was a Methodist, who converted to Catholicism because he found this group in this place where he was loved in a way he never was before wow. is walking out of there with a stack of books on like St. John of the cross, <laughs> the, you know, confession, St. Augustus confessions, all Scott Hahn books. And he's like, I can't get enough wow. of this. Why? Because now there's been an ache in my heart. It's being filled with our Lord and our Lord is opening up this place that I'm never going to find in just, rehab groups and stuff. I'm going to find in his mercy and in his love. 
Yeah. Now, I'm not saying don't go to rehab groups, don't go to A. Those things are part of the toolkit. But until we realize I'm broken and there's a Lord who wants to heal that brokenness and he's the only one that I can, yeah. then we're never going to be any better. So that's why these things are are possible. So I'm doing my best to get out there and to, and to say to men, like our podcast that came out yesterday was titled, Maybe You're, in capital, That Guy. Maybe yeah. you're the guy. And maybe yeah. because you know, you're know you sitting here, I was on a call. This answers your question, I think, even in a better way. Um, I was on a, I do a monthly Zoom call with the people that support our ministry, the guys that are in our community, the narrow road and the stuff that we were doing before. And they support the ministry. And then every month I get on there and we have a call with them and we talk about episodes they enjoyed or what's going on in their life. But we really just have this online community where we, we jump in there and just talk about life. And I was talking about this new direction, this very Paul-esque direction of going places and building and planting men's groups and how the funnel has become sort of a directive into that to the mm -hmm. point where we're even changing the website to say why we exist. So I'm talking about all this. And one guy raised his hand and he goes, can I just stop for a minute? He goes, how many guys in here see their parish or their situation in the world as a spiritual wasteland? Mm -hmm. And I went, hmm. You know, and so I was just kind of sat back and, and I started scrolling through the Zoom because there was, you know, a lot of guys on there and all of them have their hands up. Wow. And in the moment, the Lord just put them in my heart like, okay, here I'm trying to start groups. Here are all these men that have found something in this podcast. These very same men are, are expressing a loneliness, an isolation, a lack of community, a desire for all of that. Yeah. And so I said, guys, have you ever thought that maybe this ache that you're feeling in your heart, the Lord is putting there, not for you to be negative, not to gripe about it, not to moan about it, not to say, when is someone going to do something, but to really look at it and say, is he calling you to be the guy to do something about it? Yeah. Right. Is he stirring that within you? Cause you're called to a ministry that is about nothing more than helping men become better and help other men become better. Yeah. And so that's what we're focusing on is any guys that are out there that have that heart, we're willing to roll up our sleeves and go to work with and help. You know, I'd love to come to to, to the United Kingdom. I've never been over there. I'd love <laughs> to come to that area and help well, groups all over. We're, we're in the Republic of Ireland. It's like the you Republican did. of Ireland. Yeah, excuse me. Sorry. Don't want to make anybody You're mad. forgiven. You're but, forgiven. <laughs> yeah. Apologize. That's for me not knowing enough. But No, but, no you're okay. But that whole area of the world, man, I would love to come and spread what we're yeah, doing. Yeah. Um, and it's I just want to say to guys, it's possible. Like, yeah, I remember feeling so overwhelmed. But one critical thing that I did was one, I surrendered to the Lord and I said, Looks like you're calling me this. I'm gonna trust you. And it's hard. You have to continue to work at that. But then the other thing is I started to find other men that wanted the same thing in that group. And I started to not do it alone. And I said, Yeah, would you like to help? And, and we so all of a sudden we had three or four guys that were willing to take on the structure, the the four different nights of the four pillars we talk about, formation, worship, fellowship, and, and service. And they started owning those things. And it just became this beautiful thing that now we kind of go out and try to help others start. Yeah. I mean, definitely what what, what I'm seeing in Ireland is uh, we happen to, ha I happen to have done a pilgrimage two weeks ago. And on that pilgrimage, a lot, there was, there was three or four different men's groups that had providentially came together and we're talking about doing some work next year um and we are definitely looking at, at trying to see if we can get some uh, men over that like you this you've given your life to this and we should take advantage of of your ministry if you're if you're if you have time to you know sure. prompt us and help us on, on on this i mean we are coming into a different a difficult time economically around the world and i think your ministry sure. is key now as, as men face different financial problems and family struggles and all this that, you know, we keep together as men of faith. The faith will help us in times of difficulty as well. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's it, I mean, I, I've seen it. I was a seminarian for nine years and, I'm, you know, and, and during those nine years, I never thought, you know, I was really up for the task of being a priest. I kind of didn't have the confidence and, and, and so forth. And looking up at these priests that were doing films with Mel Gibson and writing oh, yeah. <laughs> 19 books and publishing this. And I said, I'm, oh, that's not for me. But today, you know, I'm in my forties and these men that I admired, they've, they've, they've chosen a different path of life. And I, I've kind of been pushed more towards, my faith you know i've uh it's kind of come full circle and uh mm -hmm. you're kind of looking around well it's time we have to give leadership as men we have to give hope we have to encourage we have to mentor and you know 
and I, I'm delighted to hear you, that friend, you know, digging into our Catholic faith. You, I, it'd be great if you did a podcast on all of the books you've read, the different books, you know, just. Oh, to, sure. Yeah. <laughs> if you did that. Some I, of them I, are over there behind me. But yeah, yeah no, do it. <laughs> yeah, definitely do a, a podcast into that because men would under, would like to know well, what what books is this guy reading? There's. Um, sure. There's a guy in, in the UK called Sam Baker, and he's founded Catholic Men UK. And you'll see some of his videos on, on YouTube as well. And he's, uh, uh, it'd be great if we got the two of you over to Ireland to next year. Uh, oh, and, that would be awesome. Yeah. We, I we would love that. to go. I'm, I'm actually uh, Scott Irish, so I'd love oh. to go back that way. And my Edwards is my last name. There was Spencer yeah. and Collins. And so yeah. I would love to, to go over there and visit uh, for sure. And, you know, you, you've mentioned something a couple of times about leadership and, and not only following on the on the bishops and the priests and stuff. You know, my bishop here in Memphis, Bishop David uh, Prescott Talley or David P. Talley, he's amazing. And one of the things that he always says is he says 99 percent of the church is on the other side of the altar. Yeah. Right. Is on the other side of the altar. This one percent up here cannot fix everything and do everything. And we need powerful lay leaders. And I think that God in times of necessity and Lord knows, I mean, Robert, we're in a post-Christian society. I mean, we yeah. need more of the body of Christ stepping up and living in their gifts than ever before. And the majority of those gifts and the majority of that body is on that side of the altar. Yeah. So, you know, whenever, if anybody out there is feeling, you know, like this desire to lead to, to, there's something more than I, I really encourage you to pray with that and to and to really spend time with our Lord about it and 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 ask Him. You know, a lot of times in prayer we spend time, you know, doing the things we should: gratitude, thanksgiving, um, you know, asking for forgiveness. All of those things are wonderful, but sometimes we need to really just sit with God and say, "What do you want of me? You know, what is yeah. your plan? What is your will for my life?" And that's often difficult because most people will go, well, I can't hear him. I don't know what his answer is. It's not like he's going to show up with an airplane with a banner, a banner flying over, making it clear for me. But that's where we have to spend that time in prayer. And then, you know, you never know. You could be the guy that is that is going to get something remarkable going in that part of the world, you know, for yeah. men or for for something else. And 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 God knows men is a place that we need to focus because to your point earlier, you look at abortion, you look at all these, you know, the divorce, fatherlessness, all this stuff. It starts with men, right? And, yes. and, and men that are not raised virtuously or or didn't have a father or whatever it may be. And if we can get to those men, then we change a lot of the problems in the church. Yeah. You know, but we've but we've got to we've got to concentrate on that. I find it funny that, you know, there's somebody was telling me years ago this may have changed. But like you go to the USCCB, you know, the and, and there was no real focus on men's ministry there. There was women's ministry and youth ministry and family ministry, but no really focus on men. And it's like when the man yeah. is not leading, everything falls apart. And so that's what we're trying to change and bring focus yeah, to. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this is this is what I find a bit frustrating. I did a video the other day and we went we have 26 reports of for this synodal process. And mm. uh, and I'm reading through these reports. I mean, it's maybe people think, oh, men have been in the church so long. Why should we focus on them? But sure. it's exactly your point. It's the key point. If you have good fathers, you have good families, you have happy wives, mm. happy women, happy children. If we think about exactly the point you made in abortion, we in the first year we legalized abortion, uh, which was 2019. We had mm. 6,666 abortions that year. Oh my so gosh. that's yeah. 6,666 men who didn't step up and help the, the woman that yeah. they got pregnant. Do you know what yeah. I mean? The, uh, uh, we're, uh, and as a Catholic church, are we able to even reach 10% of those men to show them, look, there is a better life. There is fulfillment in sacrifice mm -hmm. you know a man a father a man is made for sacrifice you know no man when a, when a robber comes in or somebody comes in to burgle your house at life turns around to his wife dear could you go down and sort out that noise downstairs and you know, sure. <laughs> you know it's right do you, you know step what I mean? up and do this that's what's yeah. happened uh, you don't need to be Catholic to be told to be a man. Like, uh, it's ingrained in us, you know, it should be. Mm -hmm. It should be ingrained in sure. us to be men of sacrifice. Um, and we need to revive um, true manhood. And we need to revive Catholicism. The Eucharist will renew. 
mass attendance will renew the church will renew if men understood their mission uh, and you know because women are very good at organizing themselves as well that you know oh, the, sure yeah and um i i do think it's a, it's 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 a little bit sad in that way um one of the things that i did when when i was traveling around the us was was travel to um I went to Alabama, Atlanta, okay. Tennessee, and traveled to different um, masses around the U.S. Wow. So uh, Novus Order and traditional Latin mass to see how how you guys are organizing yourselves. And you could definitely see where where the mass was reverent, where it was respected. You could de- definitely see more families and more men because, you know, they wanted to, uh, it seems that they wanted a little bit more of a challenge. Whereas the other masses that I saw, some of the places, you know, that that it have, you know, be very lax. You definitely sure. saw, saw a different demographic. And, and and I really do admit, think men are up for the challenge of, uh, of, of, of understanding the faith. Well, you know, they're, they're not, they don't want um, a dumbed down, washed down challenge. They sure. want a challenge, you know, I don't know what, what your thoughts are on that or how do you see yeah, it? Yeah, no, they, they do, men. We're, we're, we're always looking to conquer. We're always looking to achieve. We're, you know, in today's society, it's so funny because, you know, part of society says we're tired of your masculinity and the other side <laughs> says like be ultra masculine, like perform, <laughs> achieve. And over here, stop being a man. Right. Like, so you're, it's just super confusing with all of it. But, you know, at the end of the day, we all have a desire to be better. Like yeah. we all know that in our life we can be better. And, and that's why we have to clear out all that room, you know, and make that space for, for our Lord to be able to do that. Um, you know, it's, I can remember, you know, in my addictions thinking like, I, I'm supposed to be better than this. I should be mm-hmm. better than this. I can be, you know, if I would ever just believe it. And, and the thing is, you know, there's, we always need that challenge, but the things that we have to get past is listening to the wrong voices, listening to the world, listening to the devil, right? So many men think that, you know, I'll be happy. I'll be the man I want to be. If I just get this, if I just get that, if I just check all these boxes and, and, you know, it was a guy that used to make $200,000 a year um, who had a big house and, and a beautiful wife and the cars and all those things that you're supposed to have as a man, as the world tells you, I was miserable and mm. I was broken and I was a mess and I was hiding in drugs because those things don't ever fulfill you. Yeah. Right. And so as men, we have to get over this. There's a, there's a great fear in men that if I become a Christian man, or if I really start like living my faith outwardly, because a lot of them are Christian and Catholic men, but like, what if, if I really start taking up this man on living the way that the Lord has instructed me to in his Holy scriptures and the teachings of the church, then I'm going to lose everything, right? I'm going to mm. lose friends. I'm going to lose respect. I'm going to, I'm going to be the guy at work. Nobody wants to talk to anymore because I'm the Jesus freak, or <laughs> I'm going to lose all of this. And again, that is the devil. That is the devil in your ear going like, here's the thing. I was in a physical prison cell of mortar and iron bars and all of that, you know, they're facing my shame, my sin, my failures, everything. But every one of us is walking around in a virtual prison cell yeah. made up of four walls of our own failures, faults, shames, things were, you know, we, we didn't do as well as we thought, whatever it is. And we, we want to get out of that. And we reach for that door. And when we do, the devil shows up and he starts to poke and pride. Oh, what if they find out about this? Oh, what if they see you're not really who you say you are? Oh, what if mm. they, and he goes to poke and prod in those wounds. And he convinces you that if you push by him and you step out that door, that all that's going to be there for you is pain and loss. Like stay in here. It's yeah. comfortable in here. You have what you want. You've got a decent life. So you're unhappy sometimes. That's Okay. Just do more of what you want. There's rules and regulations out there, right? There's consequences. You got to do what that Jesus guy wants if you step out there. And so you just go, oh, and you shut the door because it sounds horrible and you believe it. But when, you, when you're when you strong enough, again, as we started this, to, to, to be vulnerable and to say, like, I'm going to get rid of these things in life. The devil shows up again when you try to open that door. But this time when he pokes and prods, those things are no longer there. Right. He has no mm-hmm. power over you in those things anymore. And when you're able to walk outside of that, you go, man, there's no pain out here. There's no loss. There's nothing but joy and yes. truth and mercy yes. and hope and peace. Yes. Right. It's everything you've been looking for. But we have to have the courage. Right. We have to have the fortitude. One of the cardinal, one of the main virtues to to be able to say, 
I'm going to take this leap of faith. I'm not going to depend on myself anymore. I'm going to put my dependence on God. And it's scary. And you don't know what's going to happen. But it's okay. Like, it's okay to say, I'm just going to trust in you, Lord, right? That's what Peter did. Falls out of the boat. Get away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. <laughs> That's all of us, right? I don't feel like I belong here. Peter, without even knowing it, had given himself a new name. Or Simon, at that point, had given himself a new name. I'm a sinful man. Right. That's who he let the whole world know in that statement right then. That's exactly what he thought about himself in his heart. I'm not yeah. good enough. I'm not the right man. Get away from me, Lord. All of us feel that way. Every yeah. one of us. Every yeah. one of us. And what did Jesus say to him? Look at me. Follow me. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Right. And he said to Moses, when Moses showed up with all his excuses, well, I stutter. Well, I'm not eloquent. Well, blah, 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 blah. God said, I'm going to make you that way. And he was even so merciful to, to Moses that he sent Aaron, who was eloquent, to speak, right? Yeah. So, I mean, with Jeremiah, you know, I'm too young. With Gideon, I'm not strong enough. I'm too weak. God has showed up every single time with all of those people from our Pope, first Pope, to the rest of them to say, you're right. You're not enough. And that's okay. You don't yeah. have to be because with me, you're going to be enough. We start to understand that as men and we take that leap of faith, right? And we step out. And we understand that I'm not perfect, but nor does God expect me to be, right? Then all he needs is my yes. And when I trust him, then he's going to give me what I need. And when I, if, I, if I'm bold enough to, to jump out of the plane, whatever you want to say, to dive into the water, or whatever you want, whatever metaphor you want to use, you're going to find that what you were so afraid of all the time was not really there. But what was there for you is a, is a loving God who welcomes you and who wants to the, the permission to use the gifts that he gave you in your life to better the world. And this is, we've talked a lot about men being different. How are there ever to be different men if there's not an example for them to look to, right? And, and, and to see, man, that guy was a drug addict and he almost lost his family. And you know what? People didn't reject him through his vulnerability and his honesty. They embraced him so much now that they 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 bring him around the world to speak to them about how they can be better. I'm using myself for an example, but there's thousands of examples out there. Yeah. This is not a unique thing that God did because he likes me better than somebody else. He yeah. uses those who desire and are willing to be used. And if yeah. you that can be from whether you're going to clean up the altar after mass or whether you're going to be a guy who starts a men's group, it, it, you don't have to be some guy on the stage. All you have to do is say, Lord, I want you to come and be the Lord of my life. I want you to show me my gifts and I give you my permission to work in my life. And if you do that, then you're going to find out what he means by I came so that you may have joy and my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Yeah. Right. I came. So to give you a life in the abundance, right? Like this is what he meant, not a car and a comfortable house and AC set at 68 all the time and all of that air conditioning. And all that. It's, you give joy because you know, and you love me. And you found that when you love me, I am the way and the truth and the life to everything you've ever been looking for. Yeah. And this is, this is the truth men need to come to know. And the more men that come to know this and start to live it, then our world will start to change a lot quicker than what we think. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's great listening to you because it's it's really it's really coming from your heart. And this is something that, you know, you, you really can't buy uh when somebody is trying to give a message that they love so much to people you, you it's very hard to give that to to buy that actually uh, and this is what's so yes it's so amazing that what i find about the faith is um you know uh, uh, 10 years ago i was struggling with a lot of things and you know i just started returning to my faith confession mass sanctifying grace reading and so forth and so forth and you just come to a realization this is wonderful this is slowly yeah. and, and, you know, and, and why aren't we, you know, you're looking around the church. Why isn't this alive in the church? You're looking yeah. at the different, you know, it's, it's quite incredible. And, and it's, you're it's like it's, the woman at the well, you're like the yeah. woman at the well that like sees Jesus and wants to run and tell the entire town. You're like, why do you yeah. not care? Why do you not? Where yeah, are yeah. you? Yeah. You're exactly like a, right. But, you know, it's frustrating. The frustrating thing is for me, I'll I'll go into a church or I'll go somewhere in Ireland. And if I'm in it, especially if I'm in a church and somebody will stop me, oh, oh, I love your podcast and you're doing great work. And I was I'm, I'm a layman. This is my pastime. I come home from work and I do something. In past 
Why aren't more people yeah, yeah. in uh, that love the faith out there giving the same message? I mean, if you had a thousand people doing this in Ireland, or it, it, and it's very simple. I mean, it, it's just sharing what you love, sharing it with others, praying yeah. with others. It's you know, passion. It's passion. exactly. It has to be. Yeah, and nobody that's would... where the. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Please. Yeah, no, nobody would would believe it. Other if you didn't put your passion into what you love. I mean, it it it, it wouldn't go anywhere. And that passion comes from first of all, foremost, having a, a real deep, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus. When I say that all the time, people go, oh, you're just an ex-Protestant. That's a Protestant <laughs> thing. And you're right, it is. But where do you think they got it from? Yeah. From the Catholic Church. If you don't think that Jesus desires an intimate relationship with you, look at the, first of all, his death on the cross. That's the most intimate and most sacrificial love that the world yeah. has ever seen. For you individually, a lot of people read John three sixteen as for God so loved everybody, but for, you know, but me. But it's not written that way. He loved you as well, and he would have died for you too. And and so what we have to understand is like this personal relationship and this knowledge of him is what drives our passion. You know, you look at you look at the sacrament of baptism, for instance. Again, we said that a little while ago. That's God like pointing down and saying, "I claim you. You're mine. I want you. You're part of my kingdom. You're part of my family. You're worth something." You look at reconciliation. I mean, it blows my mind when you think about it like this. God loves you so much that he doesn't want for one second for you to have to walk around thinking that he doesn't forgive you and he doesn't love you so much so that he puts someone physically in the room, in the persona Christi, in the person of his son, to tell you you are forgiven. Don't yeah. tell me that, there, that God doesn't love you, want a relationship with you. You look at the Eucharist, the God of the universe, made the stars, all the galaxies, everything you see in this world. He makes himself small into a piece of bread, which is transformed into his body so that he could be in you, be one with you, because he knows the things that he has asked you to do are going to be hard. And he wants to give you his very body and blood, his very strength and very self to do those things. Even, even um, you know, uh, uh, anointing the sick, things like that. You could be a jerk your whole life and God still on your deathbed, if you're Catholic, We'll send a priest there to get you to try to reconcile so that you could be with him forever. Yeah. I mean, this is a God that desires a relationship. When you come to understand what has been done for you and you truly believe it in your heart, then your heart is blown open with passion, right? Yeah. You, you can't, you can no longer go to mass and be thinking about your grocery list or the soccer game or whatever else is coming on after mass because you're sitting there going, I've been invited to the supper of the lamb. Right? Mm -hmm. I've been invited to the to the to, to the table of our God, and He has given His very life for mine, and that has to mean something. Yeah. Right. That sacrifice demands a response, and in my personal life, it demands a response, and that's what drives and 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 fills that passion. It's it's like if you try to tell somebody, I give this example a lot in a talk when I'm talking about this relationship thing, I'll say. You know, Robert, hey, you know, let me tell you about this guy named David. You know, if I told you I had a friend named David that was a nice guy, he's really cool to hang out with, he's funny sometimes, you know, uh, he does a lot of things that are cool. Does that sound like you really want to go take time out of your day to go spend time with David? No, because you're like, yeah, I don't really need to meet that guy. He doesn't sound that interesting. But if I if I were to say, Robert, like, I got to tell you something. I met this guy named David, and he has become one of the best friends I've ever had in my life. This guy is phenomenal. He's unbelievable. Like he is, he, he's the IT director at my kid's school. We, my, my, you know, his mother, you know, my wife and I have gotten our, our signals crossed on picking up kids. And he said, that's fine. I got them. Leave them in my office. Get here when you can. He's come over and helped us in projects around the house. So we didn't have to spend money. He's shown up on a, on a snowy night when I blew a tire and helped me. And he's never asked anything for return other than for me to be a good friend to him too. He is mm. one of the greatest people I've ever met in my life. Would you want to go to lunch with him? You probably go, yeah, I want to meet that guy. <laughs> Why? Because I intimately know him. I could speak passionately about him, and I could tell you what he's done to change my life. That's all we're supposed to do when we evangelize to people. Yes, is to absolutely. do that about Jesus. But we can't do that if our faith is simply rules and regulations and prayers we do because somebody says we had to and, and all of these things. You know, the rosary, a, a Catholic lady one time told me I wasn't Catholic, but I did the rosary. So what did I do every night? I was sitting there going, Hail Mary, full of grace, Hail Mary, full of grace, Hail Mary, full of grace, was not putting my heart into it. It wasn't until 
I came to a knowledge in an intimate relationship with Jesus's mother that I, I started to understand the why behind it, right? Yeah. Everything we do as Catholics, whether it's a, a devotion to a saint, a, a devotion to our lady, a rosary, a divine mercy chaplet, every bit of it is to do, we do those things to get to know Jesus more intimately. If you're saying a rosary, it's so you get to know his mother more intimately so she could better take you to her son. That's the purpose of all of these things. And if we don't start to come into a full understanding of that in our faith, then we're never going to get to the true meaning of any any Christian faith out there, which is to come into a knowledge of our Lord, to love him, to have a desire to serve him, and to go devote our lives to him. And the thing is, being Catholic, you're like super leveled up because you have all this stuff that the graces and the beauty and the treasures and the gifts of our faith that allow you to do that, in my opinion, better than any other uh, form of Christianity out there. Right. Yeah. It is the one true church church with the truth and the and the gifts and the tools to be able to lead you in into a more profound relationship with our Lord than you'll ever be able to find anywhere else, so that you can go out and do the things that we're talking about doing, like you know, yeah. serving and, and, and waking up men. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 fascinating to listen to. Uh, I put a podcast out there the other day trying to drive a, a little bit discussion. I said, I don't believe in hell. And because somebody, you know, had had left the church because they couldn't understand how could this God be so so how could he create a place where some people would go to? And I try and I try to flip it on the other on the other side. My if your life is completely surrounded by Christ, you know, he's in your life. He's he, you're there having that conversation with him. You're you're there thinking, how can I know this person even better? And you're giving that exactly what you've just said exactly what Mm -hmm. you've just said and you're giving that message to another person you're not giving them the catholic faith of rules and regulations and prohibitions and don't do this and don't do this you're giving them the beauty of encountering oh i want to go and meet that person yeah you're right you've you've described him some like i want to and then when you're there well this conversation is so good at this meal let's have a let's let's spend another hour here talking and this is what we need to do we just need to open hearts and minds to the conversation yeah. it's 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 I, I mean i don't see well, you, why i have i have never converted anybody by going why aren't you catholic you should be catholic that's dumb you're not catholic that insults people <laughs> exactly. jesus didn't do that he went up and you know what do you see the the most profound way i've ever found to you know my friend marcella june talks about this a lot of other people in the ministry is a lot of times we want to browbeat people we want to beat them over the head with the scriptures until they can you know until they submit and yeah. really what is like, I ask people, why do you believe what you believe and turn the conversation around? And that, that endears people. Like he really cares what I'm thinking about. He's not here trashing my thoughts. He's listening. And oftentimes people do more converting of themselves than you will ever do of them by looking at <laughs> after they're trying to explain to you why they believe what they believe. And then after that conversation, they go back and go, you know, I don't, why do I believe that? Yeah. And they go back and start researching it. And then they find their way into the church. There's a lot of that, but as long as we lead with all of that other stuff, we're, we're going to turn people off. You yeah. know, you wouldn't walk up to a guy and say, you know, how much money do you have in your bank account? It's none of your business. Why do we like lead with beating people over the head about Jesus before we even ask them like where they are and who they are and where and uh, what's going on yeah. in their life and all of those things, yeah. you know, it's just, it's, it's a natural way of receiving other people. And so you know, I just, I think that's where we lack in our church. We're so institutional in a lot of ways that we, we really, even in RCIA, you know, I mean, my RCIA class was, was horrible. I mean, God bless the man that said I'd, I'd teach it, but it wasn't great. And and as a Protestant who knew the scriptures, I could fly through it and, and, you know, and answer most of the questions that were part of the, you know, a part of the RCIA, but no one ever taught me why we do any of it. Mm-hmm. Right. So why would I fall in love with a, an organization if I don't fall in love with the person who started it, right. If I don't fall in love with with the reason why, and ultimately what you're talking about, the difference of what I shared with you a minute ago and what you're talking about is, is, is an understanding of how to share the charisma, the good news at the heart of our faith is the good news that we fell away from our Lord. And why is there a hell? Because we made a bad decision, right? We made a bad decision. We bit into something. We, we, we chose something other than God. And so mm-hmm. now there is there is a hell, there is good and evil. Because of two opposing forces, there has to be a choice. And our God loves us so much that he gives us free will. He says, I want you to love you. I want you to love me. And I want you to love me so badly 
that you don't even know how badly I want you to love me, but I love you so much that I'm not going to make you mm. right. That I'm going to give you a choice. And because of that choice, there's a heaven and there is a hell. Yeah. Right. And so if you choose me and you live the way that I ask you to, then you're going to spend eternity with me in heaven. But if you don't, I'm going to give you whatever you love. And if it's not me, anything you love other than God is going to be hell. Yeah. And that's where you're going to spend your eternity. And this is, I mean, Jesus could not be more clear in this. I know we're probably going a little longer than you intended, nope. but this is a good conversation. Yeah. I'm glad to have it. <laughs> so um, I, I, you know, a lot of times we focus on, like you hear a lot of sermons, for instance, when the Beatitudes comes up, like Matthew chapter five through seven, you hear, you know, everybody, the homilies that are preached are all about, you know, you know, blessed are they, blessed are they, and rightly they should be. That's like Jesus putting a cheat sheet right there that says, if you want to be a Christian, blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed are they, do these things and, and, and follow me and be, you know, be forever in heaven. What we don't often hear preached and while so many people want to fall to the sin of presumption that the Lord's mercy is enough, that I don't actually have to change my life, that if there is a God that, and one ounce of his blood is enough for me, then I don't really have to participate in salvation. I could just do whatever I want all my life. And because God's infinite mercy, if he loves me the way he says he, he does, then he can't send me to hell, right? Because that's not a good God. That's mm. the argument you hear a lot. But Jesus himself gives us the Beatitudes. But then at the end of Matthew 7, what you don't hear preached a lot, at least in the full context of it, because so much of our faith is the Magnificat version of the day. And yeah. if we're not going to daily mass every day, we're only seeing bits and pieces of the story. This is this is the point where Jesus goes and he really tells people three things. He says, if you want to be a Christian, bless are they, bless are they, bless are they. If you don't do these things, here's what comes next. Yeah. And so you hear the narrow road, like the narrow gate, right? He says... Uh, wide is, is the is the path that leads to destructions and many will find it. Narrow is the gate that leads to heaven. Well, why is there a narrow gate? What is mm. the narrow gate? Jesus Christ is the narrow gate. It, you yeah. know, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He says before that in scripture, my sheep know my voice. I am the gate, right? He says, I am the gate where they're allowed in. This is the same thing there. So he's basically saying, you know, there's two choices in this life. Narrow, the hard way is following me. If you follow it, there's a narrow gate you'll be allowed in. If you don't, you're going to be on that massive interstate with everybody else out there on the highway to hell, as ACD puts it, right? Yeah. ACDC puts it on the highway to hell. You go to the second thing. He says, um, those who hear my words and heed them, who do them, are like building a, a house on rock, right? And the winds came and the waters came and, and it stood. It withstood it. Then he says, for those of you who hear my words and do not heed them, then your house is built on sand and the winds and the rains and the floods came and washed it away. What he's saying here again is like, I'm telling you the truth and you have a choice here. This is what I call the gut check. This whole thing I'm talking about. Jesus has given us a gut check. There is a heaven. There is a hell. You can listen. And how many people in our faith show up every Sunday and they listen to Father's homily and they go, oh, isn't that great and that wonderful? And okay, mm. I'm going to try to do my best but they don't go out and heed the words. You know, it's just, it's a, it's, I went to mass and I didn't get anything out of it or man, father's really harsh. And I don't like father anymore. Cause he made me feel uncomfortable. There's any of that stuff. But when we don't heed them, Jesus is saying, you're going to wind up somewhere you don't like in that house that's washed away. It's something that doesn't last like eternity, that house built on rock. The last thing and the scariest verse in the Bible to me in that part that he says is when people come to him, it's called the true disciple in that yeah. passage. And it says, Many of you will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, when will we get to heaven? We prophesied in your name. We healed the sick. Uh, you know, we, we fed the poor. We clothed the naked. When will we get to heaven? And he says, he looks right at them. And he says, <laughs> he says, be gone. Solemnly, solemnly, I will say to you, be gone from me, evildoers. I never knew you. Solemnly, painfully, with remorse. I will say to you, be gone from me. And it's not like Jesus is sitting up there laughing. It will hurt him to send mm. you to hell. But yeah. you say, well, what? wait a minute. All these people say, I, they, they, they prophesied, they, they healed the sick, they fed the poor, they clothed the naked. Didn't they just do everything you asked them to do? Yes, but I never knew you, right? This is such a message for our times, and especially as Catholics. If I'm just checking a box, 
on everything in my life. I said my rosary today because I'm supposed to as a Catholic. I went to my night to Columbus because I'm supposed to as a Catholic. I went to this. I went to that. I did my adoration hour. If those things are just checking boxes so we feel better about we think we're doing something that makes us feel and look more Catholic, then mm -hmm. Jesus is saying solemnly, I will say to you, I never knew you. Mm -hmm. We have to be intentional about why we're doing everything that we're doing in our faith. That adoration hour has to be time for me to 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 shut out the world, to grow in, in, in prayer time with Jesus. That rosary, as I said before, has to be to grow in my relationship with his mother so she could take me to him. My devotion to St. Joseph has to be to grow in my knowledge of St. Joseph so he could better introduce me to his son. This is where we have to understand that there are consequences to not living the faith. And this is not to scare people. Our Lord is merciful. He tells us this in the scriptures. This is how the final reason I'll share with you about um, about why he wants a relationship with you. He loves you enough to tell you the truth, right? Like mm -hmm. any good parent, you know, don't touch the stove. You're going to burn yourself. Jesus is saying, don't not do this because you're going to go to hell, right? And, and, and so this is the point you're making is, is, is a great one, Robert, because we have to take this seriously. Absolutely. And we have to understand there is a heaven and a hell and that there are consequences for our choices, but it's not some demanding, you know, just overarching uh punishing god up there it's one that loves us more than we could ever fathom and is up there desiring for us to come towards him so that we mm. don't have to wind up in those places yeah, you know absolutely. god didn't make a hell so that we wound up there you know he may a hell exist because of our choices right and because of of the choice of, of lucifer first and foremost from revolting from god but but yet our god gives us everything we need to avoid that and yeah. to be with him forever. I mean, that prayer of Jesus, the priestly prayer, when he's laying on that rock in the garden, he's not praying for himself in, in John 17. He's praying for you and me, Lord, that yeah. they would be with me, that those that come to know my word through those, the apostles, would come to know me and that they, our house would have many rooms that they could be with me. And they're united in us and they're consecrated in the truth. This is what our Lord desires for you more than anything, but we have to desire it ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to put in the work. Sorry, I didn't mean to get off on a rant. There, no, but... no, I could, I could listen to you for ages. I, I like uh, you're, you're just giving me um, you know, so many talking points, and I'll be able to go back and listen to them all in the video sure. anyway. Because <laughs> oftentimes sure. you're having you're having conversations, and you're saying, "I and I write this down." Well, at least now I'm, this conversation, <laughs> I, can, I can just rewind it. What would you say? Because you know, it's it's great to see sure. how other men express their faith. Um, you know, so I can plagiarize you what you're doing. <laughs> sure, yeah, please. I mean. I'm not, <laughs> hey, it ain't my message, it's God's, right? So share, I know. share his message. But you have, uh, you've given me, you're giving me great ideas. Um, uh, and, you know, and it's the passion. It's, uh, you know, we have to be completely, you know, we have to give, it, it can't be, you know, it can't be with ulterior motives. You know, we have to give it with, 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 with you know, in the interior passion that we know this is true. I mean, this sure. is this is the frustrating thing in the church. You know, I, I you know, and in Ireland, I, I, I'm, I've seen some priests, some young priests, um, there are quite a few of them that have left the ministry or they failed for whatever reason. And I, and I feel, I feel sorry for the, for them in the sense that they've spent so many years in seminary, they've gone into ministry, and then they've left it oh, all. Yeah. And I said, yeah. what a waste, what a waste. I, I'm, I'm not saying that they wasted their life. They, they gave the best intentions they could. But imagine sure. if they'd taken just one more step and you know Christ, and then you say, oh, my God. Oh, my God, yeah. now who I've been. I mean, this is the, the kind of the eureka moment that came to me 10 years. And I said, oh, my yeah. God, because I was about to leave the church. I wanted to become an art. I wanted to join the Orthodox Church. And, you know, I was I was toying with that. And then I kind of said, Oh my God! What have we, what have I just discovered here? Because like once you know Christ, and once you once the conversation starts going, you say, "Is this really happening? Is this?" And I, and, the, and you're just there, kind of bowled over. It's like, oh, yeah. and that that's the scary. And that at the same time, you you're encountering that, and that then the scary thing is, a lot of people don't know about this. You know, and this has been this has been repeated every generation for the last two thousand years. Our our Lord is is reaching out; He's asking us to spread His message. This has been, and and people don't know about it because you would live differently. Your life is, your whole yep. view on the world is kind of completely blown open when everything you see, changes. It yeah. does. Every, every one of those. I mean, look at the the apostles. 
everyone yeah. that he called, they left everything behind and they were never, they were never the same. Yeah. You know, look yeah. at St. Paul. I mean, he falls off his horse and then the guy, the guy spends the rest of his life, you know, serving, yeah. serving God. I mean, writing things in prison, like he's sitting next to the sewers in Rome yeah. about to get his head chopped off. And he's writing like rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Like how yeah. does what? <laughs> like you're in yeah. a Roman prison about to die. You've been bitten by snakes. You've been shipwrecked. You've been beaten and flogged. You've been thrown down hills in baskets. Like yeah. how do you, because when you, when you really meet Jesus, and I think this is the point, when you come to really meet Jesus, you have an encounter with our Lord. You're never the same when you yeah. really encounter him. You can't be. Because it just reveals something to you that is so powerful. And that's why, like, the it, it's the kerygma needs to be shared more. And even the word kerygma, I mean, when St. Paul goes to describe the gospel, he uses, in the good news, he uses the, the Greek word for dynamite. Like, it's explosive. Yeah. But we look at it, and why were the people of Acts able to go out, you know, Paul and, and, and Peter and all the original apostles, and why were they able to convert thousands? Because they, people would say easy as a cop out. Well, they walked with Jesus. They knew him. It was easy for him to believe it. No, they believed because it was the truth. And they went out and, and they believed it so so profoundly and, and witnessed it so profoundly with their entire life that it changed thousands of lives. They believed that God had bestowed his own power in them and the Holy Spirit, that he would give them the words and the things that they needed to say. And then they, they believed it. I mean, how can we expect other people to believe something that we don't even seem to believe ourselves when we're talking about it? <laughs> right. It, it's like going being a used car salesman going, you know, do you really want this thing? Cause it's got a bad tire and, and it's got a bad serpentine belt and it really, it dies a lot. The battery probably needs to be replaced, but it's a good deal. You should probably buy it. You know, it's like, what? Well, no, I don't want that. You don't want it either. You know? And, and, yeah. and so that's where we have to really look at our lives and go, man, do I really believe this myself? But if I don't, there's an issue with that. And I need yeah. to really like sit and it's not a bad issue, right? Sometimes the Lord shows us these things so that we can go deeper with them, right? Like yeah. I am questioning this and Lord, I feel bad about that. And, and show me, show yourself to be real to me, right? Like I want to, I want to know more. And it's an invitation to go deeper with our Lord so that we can come out of that. Just mm -hmm. like when you're in places of desolation, you know, and, you know, for those that may not know what that means, you know, there's consolation and desolation, Ignatius spirituality, Ignatius yeah. spirituality, yeah. You know, those places where you feel far from God and alone. And no matter what you do, you don't feel him. And again, it kind of goes that question of hell. Why would a good God make hell? Or why does God allow me to go through desolation? Because there's, there's, there's times in our life where we, we need to be moved out of a place, right? Where the Lord is like gently nudging us. And I love Father Timothy Gallagher, who, who is a, you know, form, a foremost expert on, on Ignatius spirituality. But he would say like, it's in those times where you feel God is the furthest away from you, that he's so close, you can't even see him. Exactly. Right. And exactly. And, and that where he wants you to trust more and wants you to surrender more. And, and so, you know, if you are a person out there, that's like, I want that passion. I want that faith, but I don't have it. And I'm trying then, then like give that ache to the Lord because he knows you have it. He put yeah. it there in you. Be honest with him and go to him and say, like, I want to know you in the way that Robert and John are talking about, you yeah, know, and, and Lord, give me that grace and ask for that. Cause I, just like the scriptures say, why would I give you a snake when you ask for a fish? Yeah, exactly. Our Lord is not going to, our Lord is not going to, to, to not answer a prayer of, I want to know you better. He's yeah. waiting on that prayer. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I know it's amazing. Like, uh, I just, uh, I, I think we, de we definitely need to to expand this out. But um, I sure. suppose when I'm, I, and we definitely have to get you to Ireland. I'm, I'm going to ask I'd people to. listening to this video next year if you'd like John Edwards in in Ireland. Um, uh, do you think uh, could people recommend a location? where we could get men together it would a men's conference and if you're interested in going to a men's conference message me you know if we can get two or three hundred men together for a good men's conference i think it'd be great um and why am i focusing on men as i said at the start you know if we start and have good men as um, we gave that example of the 6666 men who were would have been fathers if they stepped forward to parent the child mm -hmm. instead of aborting them you know, maybe they didn't even know that child existed, but they, in a way, used a woman um, yeah. instead of loving that woman. You know, I think it's up to us to give leadership 
in this world, men that are stuck in, in depression, in addictions, in I mean, it's, it's amazing. And you just get out of that. You say, why would I live my life in that in that rush, in that circle? I mean, I, I, I don't know. Sometimes I'm either mad or I just think that this is just just so amazing. I just don't see why people wouldn't be enthusiasmed by encountering <laughs> something. So I, I yeah. don't know. But um, this has gone on way too long. Like it's, uh, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, I've enjoyed it. <laughs> I, I I thought it was fascinating. I'm going to get you. I'm going to. I, 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 if you have time later on, I'll get you back and I'll, I'll pre-prepare sure. some uh, some specific topics. And, and maybe people can leave their comments below of what they'd like us to talk about. But what I will do is I'm going to link in some of the videos that you've done with Matt Frad because mm-hmm. they're they're leaving longer ones and 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 a lot of the stuff in those videos we didn't discuss here so people can go sure. in and listen to them and then in your ministry I know people in the states listen to my podcast so mm-hmm. um uh, you have a website I'll just bring it up here it's um it, the website is called Just a Guy in the Pew, and I'm going to put the link down down below. Please support awesome. his ministry. You know, I think it's it's critical. You know uh, that we have men like you in this ministry. We have to. And now if, I know it's going to be a tough time economically, but we still need to support each other, and we need, still need to yeah. ensure that you know. Because I I did have a friend. He was in ministry, and during COVID, because he wasn't able to do to travel or give. To, talks you know he he was really struggling at that moment in time he couldn't yeah, do yeah, much it ministry tough. it's tough do you know and and i think it's important that we don't f- when it's, it's it, if you're a religious or a priest you know there was some support but if you're a man who's married and doing a ministry in the church we need to support <laughs> men like you this is kind of critical guys it's um if if we don't if we don't support you then we won't have this ministry and that's kind yeah. of where i'm going with this but um uh, John, thanks so much for your time and yeah, for your encouragement. Pleasure. And yeah, I'll leave, guys, leave the comments below, like and share this video, and and if we will definitely have you back. But I, I can't thank you enough for giving an hour and a half of your time because I know oh, I know you're man. busy. I know. Yeah, but it's a joy. I, this is a joy and a passion of my life, man. I want to. I talk can to see people that, and, and I hope the see. Lord. I hope the Lord does something with it. You know, so absolutely. It was my pleasure. Thank you for giving me the platform and for no the, problem. the time and and also too for people. You know, we just started a. We've had a YouTube channel, but we're really now. This is a new studio that we built, and and so now instead of just having audio versions of podcasts, we have video too. So yeah. that's a, just a guy on the Pew YouTube channel too. So if you want to go yeah. there and like it, subscribe, you'll be able to see what we're doing there as well. Yeah, I, I'm going to link your YouTube channel, your website, and just the Matt Frad videos. I just think people, uh, I, I've looked at a lot of the stuff I thought they were really inspiring. And, um, you. you know, we just, we try and help you as much as possible. And we'll definitely work to get you over to Ireland. And uh, we might awesome. even, ho- hopefully, hopefully see if we can even get your wife and kids over as well. So it's not yeah. just daddy traveling that, that, that they could oh, experience. Oh, yeah. But let's well, see what we, we can, can do. do. A pilgrimage. I do. Pilgrimage that's what I was so thinking. We can do one to Ireland. And yeah, 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 absolutely. Maybe and somebody stay was... a couple of days later and and do yeah. uh, and, and and do some talks. Yeah, and maybe somebody who organizes pilgrimages in the states might might help us out. So we'll we'll see. We'll see what we can do. But we'll sure. we'll, we'll, we'll we'll try and link <laughs> you in. And thanks so much for your time. I, I can't thank you enough for this. Um, for your for yes, your, sir, Robert. Your... Okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, thank you. God, God bless. God bless. Yeah.